Underground Podcast. Fringe topics with a Christian point of view. Now here's your host, Leo Rutledge. Hello and welcome to the show. Today I'll be analyzing the holidays and the depression that comes with these holidays for a lot of people. And how to go from that really to be thankful to the Lord for all the many things that we we as Christians, are provided. I mean, we don't realize how how much we're given and how much we're taken care of by the Lord, even in the littlest things. So, with that, let's begin the show. Not too long ago was Thanksgiving, and for many people, they would go together and go, for many people, they'll go to their family's house, their grandma's house, or wherever, and have Thanksgiving dinner together, and whatever, and a lot of guys will sit there and gather around and watch the game, and forget about the actual holiday, and celebrating it, and thanking the Lord, and all that stuff, well, that's just my personal opinion of it, but... Um, but a lot of people get together for Thanksgiving, and that's just the holiday, okay? A lot of Christians out there will say, oh, some Christians that'll say, oh, this is a pagan holiday for every single holiday that's on the books. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians will even say that, well, you're supposed to make no no day greater than another, you know? Well, I agree with that. Let's not make any day greater than another. But, to be honest, there are days that are greater than others in our own lives. You know, days when you get married. Isn't that a greater day than the day that, you know, you just went to work and back? You know, so there's, it's just, you know, reality says that people are going to celebrate holidays. Whether they're pagan or not, 
I don't think they're out, you know, slicing people's. I understand Halloween. That's a little bit more pagan than usual. So that's the one I really stay away from. And I did a little exposed episode on that, you know. But the point is, I'm not telling you what to do. It's up to you to decide, okay? I'm not going to be here telling you, oh, you're a bad person, you're going to hell because you celebrated Thanksgiving. You're a bad person, you're going to hell because you celebrated Easter because don't you know that's a pagan thing? Yeah, I'm not going to go there, okay? If you celebrate these things to honor the Lord, then honor the Lord with these things. That's all, okay? That's this, that's the that's where I've come now. Okay, I used to believe, yeah, they. I used to believe, oh, Christmas, there's Christmas tree is all pagan or whatever. Okay, maybe it is. Maybe it's a big pagan thing. Okay, but my wife likes to put up a Christmas tree. I'll be, I'll admit it. We don't chop down a Christmas tree. We got a fake one. Okay, and she does like to de- decorate it. And she's Filipino, and they decorate Christmas trees. They start their Christmas um, decorating. In September. So I have my Christmas tree up usually around the middle of September. I know that sounds crazy to a lot of Americans, but it's, she likes to decorate it. It's just kind of, it's just, it's no different than really a, um, a hobby or something to do, you know? So slowly but surely you do this decoration or whatever. And it's just kind of like, and me and her, uh, enjoy each other's time when we're doing these things. So, I don't think that that's so pagan and so wicked, okay? And we're not doing it to celebrate some pagan god, okay? This isn't a Halloween uh, dressing up as skulls and demons. This is us literally doing crafts together, you know? Things like that. So, I don't know. I, I honestly have trouble with people who say, Oh, you know, you're letting demons in your house by putting up a fake Christmas tree and just... We're not doing some ritual or anything. Uh, whatever. I'm sure somebody out there has got a vein popping out of their head and they're saying, oh, Satan worshiper, you know, or, or it's from the pits of hell and you're, you're teaching people the wrong thing. Well, you got to understand that I am not a pastor. I have never said I am perfect. This show is nothing about being perfect. This show is kind of the evolution of me learning to be closer to the Lord and trying to serve the Lord better. That does not mean that everything I say is perfect and nothing that anyone says is perfect. I realize there's a lot of Christians that are out there pointing the finger and judging, including me. I have done that. I do do that to some degree on some things like Joel Olstein or whatever. I disagree with him and I think, oh, he's kind of lukewarm. So I might point the finger at him. Okay, whatever. But the point is, getting back to the point anyway, is the holidays are going to happen whether or not Christians are pointing out paganism or not, okay? Unless we Christianize the whole world, which is something we need to be thinking about, you know, preaching the gospel to these people. Unless we do that, they're still going to be celebrating Christmas. So, unless we really teach these people in a kind and loving way, then how are they going to turn away from these pagan things? So anyway, I, I'm not going to go there. The thing is, is a lot of people realistically celebrate these holidays and it is very hard time of year. People get depressed, not because it's right to get depressed and want to get gifts and all these worldly things, but people realistically do want to get gifts for their family and they struggle because of this and they even go into debt because of this. They run up their credit cards because of this. And there's less daylight in the winter time, and it's colder. You feel like you're working constantly, and you just never get enough done. You never get enough daylight. You never get enough time for yourself. You never get paid enough. And all these things weigh on each other to give depression to most people. I know because I have gotten that way. I get that sometimes, honestly. I really get super down, like super depressed sometimes because of... Not because of the gifts getting and all that stuff. I don't really worry about that. But I'm saying that around this time of year, because you're working constantly and you don't get enough sunlight, that drives me nuts. That gets me depressed. I'll put it that way. And I'll admit, I I struggle with depression for all different kinds of reasons. My reasons are, well, like, I don't feel like 
my family is really all that caring about, you know, being knowing me. I, I'll put it that way. I don't feel like they're all that um, inspired to want to come and see me or call me on the phone or whatever, that type of stuff. Just my mom and dad or whatever. I'm not complaining here, okay? These are first world problems. But the point is, I'm using myself as an example to kind of show and I guess give kind of a slight testimony to show that I, other people out there, you're not alone, you know? And I feel like a misfit a lot of times, me and my wife both, when we go to our family get-togethers or whatever, because we just don't... We don't celebrate the way that these people do. And a lot of them are really kind of robot-like. They're just, they're just like, hi, how are you? How are you doing? Oh, nice car. Where did you get that? You know, that type of stuff. They, they don't want to talk about, they don't want to talk about the Lord. They don't want to know about the Lord. They don't want to hear about Him. Nothing like that. And I understand that they're just religious because they say that they're Christian, but they're not actually, you know, they're just go my, they just call themselves that. But they don't really know the depths of what that really means. And if you explain it to them, they just look at you like you got a third eye kind of thing. And it's just, whatever. I'm I'm not there to preach the gospel and, and throw it in their face. I know you're, a lot, many of you might be thinking, oh, you're supposed to pre- preach the gospel. To them. Well, you know what? Not if they won't hear it, okay? So anyway, the point is, is that depresses me and other stuff gets me depressed. Like me, I, I tend to get depressed a lot because we don't have any physical Christians near us in our town that could come over and hang out with us that actually would be knowledgeable about the things that we're into and that we know about in the Bible. We don't have people who are well, they don't even want to talk about the Bible. And let alone if you told them there's giants in the Bible or if you told them about, you know, the fallen angels in the Bible. Stuff like that. They just look at you like you're insane. And yet they're Christians. That's They will call themselves Christians. And that is really depressing to me. So I understand. We I do have some good, there's some good fr- friends of this podcast uh, you know who you are, who listen to the show every week. You guys are great, and you're on Facebook and all that stuff. And I'm not talking about you. I'm saying you guys are great. And I do, you know, talk to you guys off and on. And I struggle with talking to people in general, like messaging people and stuff like that. I've gotten people who took offense to the stuff I've said because they've misunderstood the way I typed it. Because I was saying it in a totally different way, but they assumed that I meant it some other way. So it's like, I don't even want to, I, I hate messaging people for the most part. I will do it, but it drives me nuts because I feel like, okay, when's the, when is that day going to come when this person is going to take offense to what I said and misunderstand it and think I mean it another way because my spelling's not the best, all this stuff, whatever. That's not the point. The point is is we kind of get depressed because we don't have any physical Christians that physically live near us that know about the things we know about, know about the New World Order, whatever, all this stuff, that really are into the wanting to know more about the Bible, that want to have a Bible study or something like that, you know? And that is really, that's kind of where I get the most depressed. So... You know, that it's it's nice to have people, podcasters I listen to, uh, you know, like Deception Detection, um, BDK on Omega Frequency, places, places like that. I listen to a lot of podcasts, and it's really good. But it's nothing like having a real Christian in your home and having good fellowship with good friends first. That's the thing. There's a lot of these Christians out there. They're so they might be into the Bible, they want to preach to you, but it's like they don't want to be friends first, so that when you're talking to them, you, f- you can't relate to them because they're not really your friend, they're just kind of preaching at you, that kind of thing. And that's another thing that drives me nuts, too. And I know I'm complaining about a lot of stuff, I'm not really complaining, I'm just telling you really quickly that these are the things that, as a Christian, gets me personally down, okay. 
because I know people out there are just like me and deal with these things very similar. So I'm not just saying this just to get off of my chest all these problems. I'm saying this to reach out to Christians that are just like me so that they're not feeling alone. Because, trust me, we're like the misfits out here. I mean, little Christ, or little there's Christians here and there all over the place, but they're not together. And it's nice when Christians are together. Because I have had fellowship with good Christians that believe in that stuff believe in the things that I believe in and trust me when you got good fellowship going oh man you can't get anything better but that's few and far between these days because there's so many people who are really into the health and wealth uh, prosperity teaching and not really into the actual on fire for the Lord real world you might get persecuted for your beliefs type of Christianity so getting to the point I go off on rabbit trails like crazy. The thing is, is people are t- celebrating Thanksgiving. And there's a lot of people that are alone out there. There's a lot of people who have nobody. All this stuff, you know. And I just don't want you to feel alone. I really don't. That's really kind of where the heart of this episode is. I mean, there's there's kind of like two two themes of this episode. One is depression and the other one is Thanksgiving. And I'm going to get to the thanksgiving, or the giving thanks to the Lord, anyway, in a little bit. But I just want to cover this depression thing, because this is a really big topic at this time of year. So, the thing is, depression is, you know, you really, as a Christian, we have to just believe that the Lord can take care of it. Because He can take care of it. The Lord is always there. He is always working. He's not, he's not gone. He didn't go away and leave us. He's still here. He's still with us. If you notice, you always end up with enough food to eat. You always end up with enough water to eat. There's always, unless it's something like you're constantly like wasting your money and you're spending it on the wrong things and you're doing things, you know, like stuff like that. The Lord does provide for us. And we don't notice it. Most of the time, we don't even notice all of the things that He's doing for us. God is so good that He consistently takes care of us like a father. And yet, we are so good at not noticing all of the things that He's done. I mean, here's the thing. Everything I own, everything I have... The Lord gave me. I don't have nothing without Him. Because if I wouldn't have gotten lucky and got a job, or I wouldn't have gotten lucky and got the raise, which I don't believe in luck. I believe that that is just the way things go. The Lord is providing, okay? So luck is the Lord's providing for us, okay? So stop. We don't don't need to think of give it to luck or give it to, you know the stars aligned, none of this crazy stuff, okay? I I thank the Lord a lot for my wife. I say a lot of prayers for my wife because I'm supposed to be, according to the Bible, the head of my household. That means I'm the umbrella over my wife. Now, Now, Christ is the umbrella over me. He's the one who's supposed to take care of me, and I'm supposed to take care of my wife, and if we had children... My wife would be taking care of the children and so on. You know, that's what I'm, it's kind of how, that's how the Bible places the job titles. Okay? So I always pray for my wife and I always try to um, cover, you know, all the, anything, you know, I just pray for uh, a hedge of protection around our family and our household. I pray that a lot. Okay? And if I sin, I constantly, you know, talk about my sin to the Lord. And a lot of times when I'm taking a shower, I don't know what it is, but when I get home from work, I have to take a shower. And I like to take long showers because it makes my back feel better after the hard work I'm doing. So I'm in the shower and I usually start praying throughout the whole time I'm in the shower. And not saying I'm some goody goody Christian, I'm just pointing out what I do. But. And I'll talk to the Lord and I'll start off with telling him 
all the sins that I know I've committed, all of the things that I've done, and I'll admit the the most the deepest, darkest secrets that I have that I've done, and I'll say, "Listen, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that I have offended you. I'm sorry I've done you know whatever." And I'll admit the sins, and then I'll say, "I repent of these, Lord God." And please forgive me. Have mercy on a sinner like me. It's something like that anyway. And then I'll say, um, I rebuke any spirits that I have brought into my household or into my life due to me committing these sins. And then I'll say, in the blood of in the name of Jesus or the blood of Jesus, I rebuke those spirits from having any rights into my life. And then I'll go on to thank the Lord and all this stuff and whatever. I'm just giving a rough estimate of how you, how you should be doing your uh, your prayer because not everybody knows this stuff. Okay, I didn't know all this stuff, but the thing is, is that's just the beginning. Okay, that's me getting rid of the sin, and we should be doing that every single day, repenting of every single thing we did every single day. Okay. And then give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks for all of the wonderful things He provides for us. Because He provides everything. We don't have... Uh, like, we don't have any real need because of the Lord. We're fed. We're, we, we have plenty of stuff to drink. Look in these other countries where people are starving. Now, that's not because the Lord wanted them to starve. It's because of some rich guy is taking all the money... And the food that's being sent to those people to take care of them. And keeping it, hoarding it up for himself or some elite or whatever who's running the world. So we can't really blame God for these things, okay? God gives free will to you and me, even the poor people, and even the elites. The people who want to hoard the wealth. Don't worry, he'll straighten it all out in the end, I promise you. But the thing is, is free will is reason why... Men are able to take all your money away from you and tax you to death. And also, free will is the reason why you're able to go out on the street and try to help a poor man who has nothing. So free will works both ways. And the Lord straightens it out after everyone's dead. So either way, it's all straightened out, okay? So the whole point of all of this is I'm just saying to give thanks to the Lord and give all of your your issues, all of the things that are stressing you, all the things that are bothering you, let it, give it to the Lord. The Lord will take care of it. Pray for the Lord to come into your heart, into your life, and change your life around for the better. Let the Lord in. Let Him take these things from you so that you're not worried. Let him take your bills and your worries and your grieving, all this stuff, so that you're not putting this on you. Because you're not supposed to worry about these things. Because that's that's the Lord want. He doesn't want you to be worrying about these things. Especially if you're, if you're. I'm, I'm mainly talking to believers on this episode, I guess. But the thing is, is if you're not, if you don't know Jesus, you need Jesus because He can take all of your burdens. And that's not the reason why you need him. You need him as a savior so that you can have a place to go when you die because your soul actually never dies. It'll either spend eternity in hell or it'll spend eternity in heaven. You got to pick one though. You have to make that choice. And I'll put it this way, being burned alive for an eternity, that's not my uh, most top picked uh, position, okay? So I think I'd rather try to get to know the Lord and be have a good relationship with Him. And it's not about going to church and all these, you know, religious things. Getting to know Jesus is a personal relationship. That means reading His Word and trying to follow His commandments and living a good, upright life and having kind a kind heart toward people and taking care of people and glorifying the Lord... Well, you're doing so, you know. And I mean, just you just got to get to know the Lord if you don't know him. You have to you have to call him and ask him to come into your life, kneel down and pray to him when all all by yourself when you're alone 
and ask him to come into your heart. And if you don't know him, say, Lord, I want to meet you. I want to know who you are. And he will eventually pre- pre- present himself to you. And start reading the Bible. And start to follow the, the, the commandments. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, love God, the Father, Jesus Christ, and all that. You know, love that as your only God. Whatever, I'm messing it up. But here's a little thing here of the Messiah. This is kind of a good um, sum up of Jesus and how it all began with sin and everything and how it will all end in the end. This is a good sum up of everything. So listen to this. There's this crazy story at the beginning of the Bible. We have Adam and Eve and they're in the Garden of Eden. And everything in this garden is great. It's exactly as it should be, except there's this one tree that they're told by God not to eat from because it's dangerous and it will kill them. So that's it. Uh, Avoid this fruit tree and we're fine. Right. It seems pretty simple. But in this garden, there's a snake. And it starts telling a different story. It says that if you eat of this tree, it's not going to kill you. In fact, it's going to make you become like God. And Adam and Eve, they believe the snake and they eat the fruit. And because of this, the goodness of the garden is tragically lost and evil and death enters into God's good world. Now, why is there a talking snake in the garden? I mean, this thing is a problem. Yeah, it's very strange. And even more strange is the fact that the Bible doesn't say why or how this thing even got there. It just presents the snake as this creature who's in rebellion against God and that wants to get other people to doubt God's goodness and lead them on a path towards death. And so whatever this snake is, it's the source of evil that pervades our world and our lives even still today. But there is some hope because right here in the story, God makes this really interesting promise to Adam and Eve. That someone is going to come in the future, a son of Eve. And this guy's going to come and he's going to crush the serpent's head and destroy evil at its source. However, during this battle, the serpent is going to bite this guy's heel. So it's like a mutual destruction. Yeah, it's this very strange but beautiful promise. And it's just left hanging there until the next key moment in the story when God singles out this guy named Abraham and says that through his family, goodness and blessing is going to be restored back to all of the nations of the world. And as we follow this family, we get to one of Abraham's great grandsons, this guy named Judah. And he receives this promise that a king is going to come from his line and that the whole world's going to follow this king and he's going to bring peace and harmony and there'll be lots of food and wine and milk and vineyards and it's going to be awesome. The first king that we meet from the line of Judah is a guy named King David. And he's a hero. Maybe he is the snake crusher. But it turns out that David is infected with the same evil as the rest of humanity. He never crushes the snake, just the opposite. However, God makes a promise to David that this king is going to eventually come from his line. But as you go on in the story, one by one, each generation of his sons, they're just total chumps. They give in to the snake, they choose evil, they go after money and sex and power and following other gods. Things get so bad that they run the nation of Israel right into the ground and the big bad empire of Babylon just takes them out. And so now there are no more kings to even fulfill this promise. So it seems like the whole plan is lost. But during these dark days, there's this crazy group of guys called prophets and they just kept talking about this coming king and reminding us of the promise that he'll come, he'll defeat evil, he'll restore the garden. Now, one specific prophet, Isaiah, he tells us more about why this king is bitten. Isaiah says that the promised king receives this wound because of humanity's evil and that it kills him. But then all of a sudden he comes back and Isaiah says it's because he suffered this wound that he can now become a source of healing to other people. But the Old Testament ends, and the snake-crushing king that everyone's been talking about never shows up. And this is why, when the New Testament begins, it introduces us to Jesus of Nazareth, not as some random guy, but as someone who comes to fulfill these specific ancient promises. Yeah, we learn that he's from the line of David, Judah, and Abraham. And he goes around Israel announcing that the goodness of God's kingdom is here now. And he begins confronting the effects of evil on people by healing them, by forgiving them of their sins and evil. Many people 
are now believing that this is, in fact, the promised king. But Jesus began telling his closest followers that he was going to become king and bring peace by taking the full effect of humanity's evil into himself. The fatal snake bite wound. Exactly. And so it seems like the serpent wins. And this story actually would be a tragedy except for what happens next. Jesus rises from the dead. And now Jesus has the power over evil and death for himself. And so the rest of the New Testament is then making this claim that Jesus' power over evil and death has now become available to us to begin confronting the effects of evil in our lives. But even still, death and evil are a real problem in our world all around us. And so the story of the Bible ends by describing this future day when Jesus comes back and he finishes the job. He destroys the snake once and for all and he restores the goodness of the garden here on earth. So that really sums up everything. I mean, I really like how simple that makes everything. And it talks about how sin kind of has gone through all these different incarnations. And it's taken the world astray. But Jesus has conquered sin and conquered it all. But right now, i just like to just, you know, here just to show people what to thank the Lord for. I'll just thank the Lord. I'll talk about the things that I want to thank the Lord for. Like, I want to thank the Lord for my job. I don't really like my job, but if I didn't have my job, I wouldn't be able to make money to provide health insurance for my wife because she has a kidney transplant and she needs medication to keep her alive. So that's a big thankful thing. And other things like having money to survive and whatever. So that's one thing I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for the Lord providing us with two cars so we can get to work and back. I mean, that's simple, but we have vehicles so we can travel to work and go on trips, whatever. And we have a home. It's not a great home, but it's a place, you know, that we can call home and it's ours. And we don't have to worry about, you know, living with someone and all that. And I'm thankful for the Lord for giving me my wife, you know, and I think I've said that before, but I've had a terrible life really up until I was with her. It was kind of off and on, and it's just not a very good life. And since I've been with her, I've had a pretty good life. I mean, honestly, I have nothing to complain about. And and other things, like, I'm thankful for having, you know... Everything around me, you know, having friends, whatever, people I meet on Facebook even. I'm thankful for you guys, you know, um, that type of stuff. There's a, I could go on and on. I'm sure I could narrow it down to thousands of things. But those are some pretty big things. But most of all, I am thankful for the Lord. I'm thankful for him showing me the new world order, showing me all the truth behind everything. And counting me as one of his people to be knowledgeable about all these deceptions that are in the world and able to see through all these things and know that they're frauds and to see his true way. And I'm thankful for him for counting me as a person who can hear his word because we can't even know the Lord unless he calls us to know the Lord. So I'm thankful for that very simple thing. And that's very important because without that, I am lost. Without him calling me, I am lost. Now here's a reading of some scriptures about thankfulness in the Bible. Thankfulness. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness that my soul may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Psalm 30, 11 and 12. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians 9, 11. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalm 34, 1b. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk, or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Ephesians 5, 4 
Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you, and you will honor me. Psalm 50, 14 and 15 Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6 Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. Psalm 95, 2 Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. Colossians 2, 6, and 7 Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. Psalm 104 Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Colossians 3.15 I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving, be made on behalf of all men. 1 Timothy 2.1 I will praise the name of God with song and magnify Him with thanksgiving. Psalm 69.30 Devote yourselves to prayer keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Colossians 4, 2 For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God in prayer. 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 5 Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises to our God on the lyre. Psalm 147, 7 Therefore, since we receive the kingdom, which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Okay, so that's uh, scripture on giving thanks to the Lord. So now I think, just fitting to this podcast or this episode, I'm going to play... um, my wife's type of music or my wife's kind of pick of giving thanks to the Lord this is a type of music that she would listen to when she was in the Philippines so this is a good positive um, kind of classy Filipino girl singing a song about giving thanks to the Lord and this kind of matches this episode so listen to the song He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ.
That's the type of song that my wife would listen to at her church in the Philippines. That's the type of stuff that they play there. Um, they're a lot more wholesome, I guess is the word. I hate that word. It sounds a little old, but their music is a lot more innocent and more old-fashioned. And I almost, I, it sounds weird, but I think I almost like that better than the um, the type of stuff like the Beyonce's and all the crazy stuff you see here. I mean, even Christian music in the U.S., it's really, yeah, it's, it all sounds the same to me. I, I can't really tell anyone apart from another, you know. They all sound like U2 or Coldplay or something like that, and it's just the same. I mean, I used a little bit of my music at the beginning of this episode, but that's about it. And Whatever, it's not about the music. It's about giving thanks to the Lord, okay? That's what this whole episode was devoted to. It's not a very dark and grim episode. It's about getting through the darkness and finding the light that is in Jesus Christ. And I hope that message really comes across, okay? I figured I had to do a light episode for once. So that's pretty much it for the show. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy this show, please feel free to share it. You can find us on Spreaker, iTunes, and most pod catchers. And if you'd like to support the show, please leave a review on iTunes or Spreaker or wherever you find this show. And for more information on this show, go to the Fringianity Underground podcast Facebook group and like us. Images will be posted there for this show and others as well. Please check Spreaker or wherever you get this podcast every Sunday evening for new episodes. And thank you for listening.